Just before we get started, I do want to say that there are some mysterious pronunciations in here. A lot of the things I just can't find in my regular pronunciation dictionaries, so I am doing my best. Let's get on with it. The Mediterranean is home to many mysteries and wonders. Both natural beauties and human-made shipwrecks lay at the bottom of the sea, awaiting to be discovered. As the famous poem puts it, right here on the ocean floor, such wonderful things surround you. What more is you looking for under the sea? We got the spirit, you got it here, under the sea. But even the imagination of Walt Disney Studios could not fathom the existence of the location that we are going to talk about today. We are going to take you to the delta of the River Nile in Egypt. Four miles, or 6.5 kilometers, off today's coastline, under the watery surface, an archaeological expedition discovered an ancient Egyptian city, which was one of the biggest ports in the Mediterranean before the founding of Alexandria. So what was its significance? How was it discovered? And how did it vanish from the face of the Earth? and from the history of mankind. Well, welcome to Geographics, and today we're going to explore the lost city of Thonis Heracleion. The city of Thonis, known to the Greeks as Heracleion, was founded in the 8th century BCE at the entry of the River Nile in what is today the Bay of Abukir. The city remained in existence for 16 centuries until the 8th century CE, but then it almost completely vanished from memory. Prior to its discovery, the name Thonis was almost unknown to the history of mankind, but the city had known glorious times in the ancient world as it was the obligatory port of entry to Egypt for all ships coming from the Hellenic world. Its importance was also religious because of the Temple of Amun. This god was the most important in the Egyptian pantheon at the time and played an important role in rites associated with dynastic continuity. And yet, Thonis was only mentioned in passing in a few ancient classic texts and inscriptions found on land by archaeologists. Perhaps its fame and function had been obscured by its more famous neighbor Alexandria, another port city founded in honor of Alexander the Great in 331 BCE. The Greek historian Herodotus in the 5th century BCE wrote about a great temple that was built where the mythical hero Heracles first landed in Egypt. He also reports of Helen's visit to Heracleion with her love of Paris before the Trojan War. More than four centuries later, the geographer Strabo simply noted that the city of Heracleion, with its temples, was located straight to the east of Canopus at the mouth of the Canopic branch of the River Nile. The city was also mentioned by the Greek historian Diodorus of Sicily in his great work Bibliotheca Historia between 60 BCE and 30 BCE. And then silence fell over the forgotten city. But not entirely forgotten, as scholars and archaeologists from the early 20th century continued to be fascinated by the possibility of finding it. In 1933, a promising sighting happened. An RAF pilot flying over Abakir Bay spotted what looked like ancient ruins under the water. He reported the sighting to a local prince who sent a diver to investigate. But nothing was found at that time. It would take almost 70 years and a French statistician to solve the mystery of Thonis. Frank Godiot is the founder of the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology. As the grandson of the inventor of the catamaran, Frank always had a passion for sailing and diving. After graduating in statistics and economics in Paris, Frank Godiot worked as an economic counselor for the United Nations, employed in missions in Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia, later as a financial advisor to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In the early 1980s, he decided to quit his job and dedicate himself full-time to his new passion, underwater archaeology. Frank is an archaeologist and a historian, and certainly not a treasure hunter, but some of his findings bear that adventurous mark. Over the years, he has explored numerous shipwrecks, including the Spanish galleon San Diego, or the Royal Captain, an East India Company ship that sunk at 350 meters below sea level. In 1996, Godio embarked on his most ambitious mission. Knowing about Thonis from the ancient accounts, and having heard about the 1933 sighting, he organized an expedition to Abakir Bay. First, 
Godio assembled his team, recruiting not only archaeologists, Egyptologists, and historians, but also geologists, geophysicists, computer engineers, and expert divers. They all worked in partnership with the Egyptian Ministry for Antiquities. Godio and his team started surveying the site with the help of cutting edge, non intrusive technology. One of the pieces of kit was a specially developed nuclear magnetic resonance magnometer, or NMR. The highly sensitive instrument was developed by the French Atomic Energy Commission, based on simultaneous proton and electron magnetic resonance, also known as the Abraham Overhauser effect. The NMR magnetometer measures the absolute value of the Earth's magnetic field. This happens at a rate of more than 1,000 times per second, with an accuracy of 1 50 millionth of the magnetic field value. And if I sounded convincing reading that, that I did a good job, because I have no idea what that's talking about, and if a physicist wants to chime in in the comments, I would be most grateful. But I guess for our purposes, the important thing is to know the outcome of the NMR survey, and that's the creation of precise magnetic maps of the seabed, which can provide vital clues about the location, orientation, and size of potential buried archaeological features. If the data provided by the NMR and other instruments provided positive clues, then Godio and his team would dive to start the actual full archaeological excavation. One day in 1999, Godio was diving at a depth of 20 feet or 6 meters in terrible visibility. Following a clue from the NMR, he was able to find a breakthrough. He had spotted the broken shafts of centuries old red granite columns protruding from the sediment. These columns were ruins of Canopus, another smaller sunken town close to Thonis. But he could not immediately be certain of it and his explorations continued. The following year, excavating a nearby spot, he found confirmation of more ruins. This was the foundation of a wall three meters thick made of limestone blocks. And with this, he finally had proof that Thonis existed. Godio's team set to work, a long and tiresome project which indeed is still going on today. The difficulty comes from the fact that the Thonis ruins were not sitting on the seabed ready for collection, but rather were hidden beneath the sand. First the team used a water dredge, basically an underwater vacuum cleaner that sucks away sand. Then they created large square holes around the newly found objects and cleaned them with spatulas. Thanks to this procedure, we can admire the breathtaking beauty of these ancient Egyptian statues which appear suspended in a sea of water and time. In accordance with UNESCO recommendations, artifacts were usually left on site, but Godio was able to take some of them to the surface for study and conservation. Smaller objects are placed in nets and plastic baskets, while heavy artifacts are attached to a crane. Indeed, other objects are attached to an underwater floating balloon, which just made water archaeology even cooler than it already is. Also, if the team finds something that is too big for the balloon or the crane, they have a special underwater elevator to bring it to the surface. Once an object reaches the surface, it is carefully labeled, cleaned in seawater and placed in a desalination tank. The tank is filled with 50% seawater and 50% fresh water in order to avoid deterioration from violent osmosis. And if there are any chemists in the audience, feel free to explain that in the comments. Thank you very much. The process of desalination, or removing sea salts from the surface of the object, goes on for days, the point being to avoid corrosion and deterioration. The process continues by replacing excess water with resin to ensure that the volume of the material is maintained. Metal objects are subjected to an even more complex treatment, which involves bathing them in chemical or electrochemical treatments and then covering them with a protective layer. When we learned all of this, we understood one thing, and that's that if Indiana Jones could ever be bothered with actually returning something in a museum, it would probably be ruined forever, unless he keeps electrochemical solutions in his fedora. Jokes aside, though, this really does go to show the meticulous scientific work involved with preserving all of those ancient artifacts that we see in our museums. After years of exploring Abakir Bay, Godio and his experts were able to bring light to an impressive array of historical treasures. Early key discoveries confirmed to Frank that he found what he was looking for. First, it was that of the Naos, a monolithic chapel dedicated to the god Amun. An existing relic, the steel with the decree of Canopus, placed this shrine in the city of Heracleion. Another find confirms the location's identity, a gold plaque inscribed in Greek indicating that King Ptolemy III had founded a shrine to Heracles in this place. Up until now, now, historians were convinced that the legendary Thonis and Heracleion were two separate cities, but another steel found by Godio named this city as Thonis. 
This clarified that there was only one city known with different names by Egyptians and Greeks. The same steel clarified the main function of the port city. It was a gateway to the Egyptian markets for Greek goods whose importers had to pay a levy to the pharaohs. In other words, it sort of acted like customs. The location of Thomas controlled access to the Canopic Channel of the Nile Delta. By its position, it was the main port for trade with the Hellenic worlds. Further proof that Thonis was at the heart of sea trade routes between these two important civilizations was the discovery of the remains of more than 64 shipwrecks and 700 anchors. Many of these ships appeared to have been sunk on purpose. According to Dr. Robinson, a collaborator from Oxford University, this might be a means of blocking enemy ships from gaining entrance to the port city. Thonis was not just a place for business, but also for worship. After their dangerous journey, sailors dedicated offerings to the gods. Remains of their gifts were found scattered on the floor of the bay. Such as small votive anchors and amulets. Near the Naos, or chapel we described earlier, archaeologists found a large basin of red granite, probably part of a large temple dedicated to the goddess Cyrus. The basin contained three colossal red granite statues over five meters high, representing a king, a queen, and the god Happy. Happy was the personification of the periodic flooding of the Nile, which spelled fertility and abundance for ancient Egyptians. The temple was lined with more bronze statues of divinities and ritual instruments, as well as dozens of small limestone sarcophagi. These are believed to have once contained mummified animals put there to appease the gods. Gaudio so far had found very few objects from the Roman period. This may indicate that the empire did not attribute great importance to Thonis after their conquest over the Ptolemaic dynasty, of which Cleopatra was the last ruler. But his team did find more clues of the presence of the Byzantine Empire, the successor to Rome. The presence of Byzantine jewels and coins helped to place, in the 8th century CE, the final collapse and sinking of this once grandiose city. These spectacular findings brought to the surface can be seen in person in Alexandria in two permanent exhibitions at the Museum of Antiquities and the National Museum. Frank Gorio's foundation, the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology, also organizes touring exhibitions which have visited Europe and the United States in the past. Please do check out the video in the description for links to the foundation and to Frank's own website where you can find some stunning photos of the underwater relics. But now, let's move on. We just talked about what we found in Thonis, but well, what did it look like? Studies on artifacts have found that Thonis was huge, hinting that there is yet more to find. To put it into context, Frank said to the Telegraph, You know Pompeii? Pompeii is a very small city. They started archaeological excavation there in the 18th century, and it is still not excavated fully. Thonis Heracleon covers an area that is three times the size of Pompeii. Having been founded before Rome in Alexandria, Thonis once held the record for being the largest port in the Mediterranean, which means that it was huge not just in size, but also in importance. It was a trade route to Egypt, an economic powerhouse, a center of worship, and it also had great political significance. Every new pharaoh had to visit the Temple of Amun in Thonis in order to receive the title of their power as universal sovereign from the supreme god Amun. Amun was a solar god associated with the sun, with creation, and power. Over the centuries, its worship had grown to the point of eclipsing many other deities. It is believed that Egyptian religion became a monotheistic cult of Amun in the 14th century BCE. At the time of Thonis's heyday, Amun's popularity had spread to other parts of the Mediterranean where his attributes were combined with those of existing deities. In Rome, for example, you had Jupiter Amon, while the Hellenic world had Zeus Amon. Even Alexander the Great, having conquered Egypt, sought legitimacy from Zeus Amon like the pharaohs had before him. But going back to Thonis, an analysis of the coins and ceramics found underwater has led us to believe that the city was at the peak of its opulence from the 6th to the 4th century BCE. The city extended radially around the Temple of Amun, traversed by a network of canals, which must have given it the appearance of an ancient Venice of the Nile. On the islands and islets, inhabitants built their dwellings and secondary sanctuaries, all joined together by a network of ferries, bridges, and pontoons. The landscape was completed by further shrines and esplanades supporting pavilions, which overlooked artificial lakes. Like Venice, Thonis also had its Grand Canal. It was located by the second most important temple of the city, that of Heracles. This flowed through the city from east to west and connected the port basins with a lake to the west. Merchandise from shipping 
fishing was taken to this lake, then through a secondary canal, and to the nearby Canopus, which in later years would be connected to Alexandria via another waterway. All this sounds like a landscape out of a fantasy novel that may well have rivaled real Venice in architectural beauty. And amazingly, this is probably not even the full picture. Frank Gaudio estimates that only 5% of the city has yet been discovered. As we know by now, Faunus eventually declined in importance, and its own physical structure gradually slipped into the sea from the 3rd to the 8th century CE. This wasn't a sudden traumatic catastrophe like the events at Pompeii, rather a slow descent, which, as sad as it sounds, likely didn't cause any victims. But why and how did an entire city vanish into the sea and then just disappear from memory? Experts such as Gaudio and Professor Cunliffe and Dr. Robinson at the Oxford Center for Maritime Archaeology have formulated a bit of a theory. They think that Thonis suffered from a structural flaw which undermined its overall strength. The Egyptians had built a city upon a portion of the Nile Delta which was particularly susceptible to subsidence, a gradual collapse of the sediment under its foundations. The collapse may have been worsened by the sheer weight of the colossal structures built upon the many islands of Thonis. The area was also prone to earthquakes which may have caused enormous tidal waves. This implies that even before its final sinking, Thonis had to wage a centuries-long struggle against the elements. Eventually, rising sea levels and subsidence may have caused a final collapse in the area, causing the entire city to drop by about 12 feet under sea level. But now we move on to the question of how did it disappear from our memory. This is even more difficult to explain, and we can only really speculate here. As we know, the foundation of its rival, the great port city of Alexandria, may have contributed here. Alexandria became the main hub for maritime trade in the eastern Mediterranean, and the importance of Thonis it just waned over time. When the Romans took over, they dealt another blow to the city simply by ignoring it. As testified by the almost complete lack of Roman era findings, the empire must have favored Alexandria or other ports for their trade or naval purposes. Another contributing factor may be religious. Thonis was the main religious center dedicated to the cult of Amun and, to a lesser extent, to Happy and Heracles. Romans may have diverted the attention of worshippers to other cults, and during the Christian era, the cult of Amun barely resisted until the 5th century CE, before disappearing completely. All these possible theories do not imply that records of Thonis were actively removed from history. What may have happened is that historians, chroniclers, and other authors may have simply started ignoring the proud port, favoring descriptions of Alexandria and its lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the world would have continued to ignore Thonis, relegating it to a couple of passing mentions in ancient texts, if it weren't for a statistician and a magnetometer. The story of Thonis carries a warning. Our cities are not eternal. Nature in the form of subsiding foundations, tidal waves, or rising sea levels can exact its toll and reclaim our proud accomplishments to an eternity under the sand. Or rather, maybe the nature itself, I should say our lack of respect and of consideration for nature. Warnings aside, I do hope that this video has inspired you to learn more about the wonders of ancient Egypt, and maybe even seek out one of the exhibitions about the findings of Thonis. What I've learned for sure is a newfound respect for the work of archaeologists, historians, and other experts who support them in their work. In the age of Wikipedia and Google Maps, it's easy to assume that we know everything about our world's history and its geography. After all, our presence on the Earth as part of structured civilizations was just a blink of an eye. But it is fascinating to find out that out there, there is still plenty to discover about how our ancestors lived, prayed, fought, and eventually vanished into oblivion. As for me, well, I'm off to buy a magnetometer on eBay. I'll see you next time.